Okay, the um, Academic Research and Student Affairs Committee of ENCHI is now called to order. Uh, would you please take roll? Winter? Chair Del Carlo? I'm here. Vice Chair Perkins? Here. Regent Brown? Here. Regent Cruz Crawford? Here. Regent McMichael? Here. You do have a quorum. Thank you, Winter. And with that, we'll go to um, public comment. Is there any public comment in Reno? Chair uh, Regent Arascott, are, are you up there? Is there any public comment? None in Reno. Oh, thank Chair you. Chair Del Carlo? Linda King. Yes. Linda King, for the record. If you could announce the call-in number for those wishing oh, to give public comment via phone. I don't think I was given that. Um, I believe you can find it at page one of the agenda. I got it right here. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, for those of you who would like to call in and offer public comment, please dial 669-444-9444. Four, 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 nine, and enter meeting ID... Nine two eight four nine four four five zero oh, six nine and passcode five 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 five. You're gonna have to really want to call in to remember all those numbers. That's why I said them slowly. I will ask for public comment from the meeting sites first. Is there any public comment at GBC? None, none at this time in, in Elko. Thank you. And we've already heard from the system office in Reno. And is there any public comment in Las Vegas? I'm seeing maybe one person. Nope, he's not coming to the podium. Okay. Is there, SCS, is there any public comment on the phone? There are no callers at this time. Okay, we'll get on with our meeting. Thank you. Okay. Um, Item number two, we have consent items. Do I have, uh, uh, anybody want anything pulled out of consent? On the committee, hearing none. Do I have a motion to approve? to approve. Okay, thank you, Regent McMichael. I have a motion to approve the consent items. Second. Thank you, Regent um, Brown. All those in favor of approving the consent items, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? All right, motion carries unanimously. With that, we'll go on to item number three, CSN, pro program proposal for the AAS in funeral services. And with that, turn this over to Vice President, is that right, James McCoy? Indeed, good morning, good morning. For the record, my name is James McCoy, Vice President for Academic Affairs at the College of Southern Nevada. Uh, Chair Riccolo, esteemed regents, colleagues in the room, it is my pleasure to introduce to you for your consideration a new Associate of Applied Science degree in Funeral Services. Get a load of this. This is awesome. The CSN School of Health Sciences faculty with the support of Dr. Janice Glasper, Dean for the CSN Ingolstadt School of Health Sciences, have worked diligently with local community industry leaders to develop this direct to workforce degree. I'd also like to express the gratitude to the Inchi Academic Affairs Council for their support of this proposal as well. So CSN has been working closely with the funeral services and mortuary science industry leaders uh, here in Southern Nevada and throughout the state uh, to develop a new highly skilled, highly paid technical workforce pathway for our region. There's currently no funeral service program in the state of Nevada, resulting in Nevada funeral homes having to rely on students, of course, and employees from out of state. No doubt the COVID pandemic demonstrated the extreme need for workers in this profession. The following comment actually was received from a leader at a local funeral home here in Southern Nevada regarding the current challenges finding local employee, that local employers face, and it goes like this, and I quote, the state of Nevada requires associates that meet with a family that has suffered a loss to hold a funeral arranger's license in the state of Nevada at a very minimum. 
This licensure is obtained through a test that includes state law knowledge as well as industry knowledge. Nevada does not have such an educational program, so we have to recruit qualified employees from out of state. Now, according to the U.S. Department of Labor and Bureau of Labor Statistics, careers in this field in the mortuary sciences and the funeral services uh, is projected to grow by 8% through the year 2031. Let's talk about wages. The median annual wage for funeral home managers is $74,000 a year. The median annual wage for morticians and funeral arrangers is $58,900 per year. Funeral service directors will be a constant employment need due to growth in our population that we have all felt, not only here in Southern Nevada, but throughout the state. And this program can lead to several different potential career paths to include funeral arranger, embalmer, and funeral directors. Let's talk about some of the outcomes that we've built into this curriculum. The funeral services program prepares students for the role of a funeral service professional in modern society. Students learn about all aspects of funeral services to include arrangement, performing funeral services themselves, embalming, and the preservation and the art of restoring the physical appearance of the deceased. Students learn about grief and counseling through those experiences. They also learn about the history of the profession from ancient Egypt to the present day. Students take part in practicums, requiring them to work with local funeral-related establishments to gain knowledge and skills like a clinical experience through their chosen field. So the program curriculum has been reviewed and endorsed by local industry professionals. This is something that we always talk about when we talk about the de development of degrees and certificates that lead directly to the workforce. Our assurance is that the employers in this field are indeed going to be met with qualified employees when they come out of one of our industry institutions. This proposal is no different. The local industry sector of funeral and mortuary sciences have come to the table with us. They've helped us design this curriculum. In fact, this is a long time coming. We've been at this proposal for almost three years. Hence the reference to the, uh, the immediate needs of the COVID environment that I referenced earlier. Not only has the business and industry come to the table to help us design this curriculum to ensure its alignment to the accrediting body, but also to support, hi Janice, to also support uh, the program in the way of financing. They've donated financial uh, unrestricted dollars to help us support the initial setup for equipment. They've offered the opportunity for us to rely on the practitioners in Southern Nevada to serve as faculty in our program. And perhaps even most impressive, they've offered scholarship money for the first several cohorts to go through this program. No doubt, the industry is crying in support of this program. The CSN Funeral Services Program is a limited entry program within our School of Health Sciences. It's housed at the CSN Charleston campus, and it will apply for accreditation by the American Board of Funeral Service Education. How about that? If we get this accreditation, it'll be the only accredited program in the state of Nevada in this space. CSN is perfectly positioned to fit this tall order for funeral services in Nevada. It will be an accredited program offering high quality education at an affordable cost, the CSN program will prepare graduates to enter the local and state community. The industry is ready to support this program, as I've noted. The local funeral home directors say they are, there's a tremendous need in this program, and we are ready to meet them where they are at. We're thankful to our industry employers who have not only endorsed this new degree program, as is evidenced through their written support included with the proposal in your, in your handouts, but we're also grateful to them for their contributions in helping us develop the right lineup of courses for this degree. This new AAS and funeral services has a support and backing from industry leaders that you recognize right here in town as Paul Mortuary and Cemeteries, Davis Funeral Homes and Memorial Park and Kraft Sussman Funeral and Cremation Services. Accompanying me today is Dr. Janice Glasper, our Dean of the CSN Ingolstadt School of Health Sciences who can help answer any questions that you have today. Thank you for your kind consideration of our proposal. Thank you for your presentation. And with that, do we have any committee members with questions, comments? Uh, Regent Brown, please. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Regent, Regent Brown, for the record. Um, I think it's amazing that, you know, this is just one of the examples where CSN partners with the community and builds um, curriculum that actually is wanted by local industry. And I'm glad that to see that all the major players in town are not only embracing, but also funding it. Um, what has the student response been? Has there been any outreach to um, students to see if there's a pipeline that will be active and, and want to engage in this uh, program? Dr. Glasper? Uh, 
Janice Glasper for the record, Dean for the Ingolstadt School of Health Sciences, yes. Uh, these learners are primarily coming from those entities that are supporting this program from the industry. What is currently occurring in Nevada related to funeral service and cremation services is that they come in from outside the state, but they have to be employed and monitored closely by, supervised by a, a credentialed employee in that industry in this state for one full year before they can become credentialed or certified in the state. So m many of our learners will be coming from the industry. We've also been uh, accumulating an interest list uh, individuals that have been referred to us from the industry for uh, uh, enrollment, uh, pursuit of the program. So we're keeping a running list. And as we move forward, we will be doing some marketing to bring in uh, more interest in enrollment in that program. I don't know if uh, Dr. McCoy mentioned one of the big things about uh, partnering with our local entities in funeral service is that in addition to what they've already offered, they are also serving as uh, affiliate, affiliates for our learners. That is, our learners, when they go through the program, will be able to go to these facilities and actually perform their clinical experiences. And clinical is in high demand in our health sciences program. So when we have a facility that's willing to say, you can use my clinical site, we snap them right up. So that's another uh, positive in uh, collaborating in the community. Did I answer your question? Please do, Regent Brown. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that. Regent Brown, for the record. Um, I think that's wonderful. I, the, the fact that you can even build the pipeline from the recruiting pipeline from the actual industry, you know that you're getting people that are one engaged, really want it, they have the support of the industry, uh, being able to have affiliation with and do clinical practicing. Yes. I mean, you're getting on the hand job. And, and Dr. McCoy has heard me say this, this is one of my favorite parts um, about um, our system is that we offer this type of relationship with our businesses. Yes. Um, I think, you know, you can always have someone that goes to the post-secondary commission that um, gets a licensing, uh, but they don't have the wraparound services that we provide at an NG institution. So one, I'm just thankful that the community has seen this and, and is embracing this collaboration. Um, and I'm just really grateful that you guys are actually expanding this part of CSN. Um, and this is a really interesting uh, service and I'm glad that we're gonna be able to offer it locally instead of having uh, yet again to reach outside of Nevada to um, fulfill what we need here locally. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Yes, re, uh, Chair Carvalho. Thank you, Chair, Chair Del Carlo. Nice to see you, Dr. Glasper. Um, as somebody who's studied burial practices and culture as it relates to um, how we handle our, our, our deceased family members, I think this is really interesting that you're bringing this forward. Um, I'm also aware that there's uh, a lot of um, new technologies and new ways to honor our our uh, our family members who are who have passed. Um, not just in it, it it isn't only just burial or cremation. Um, there are a lot of other options out there, and I look forward to seeing how your program addresses some of that and hopefully um, become advocates for other ways of um, honoring our 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 loved ones. Thank you. We certainly will. And having um, uh, faculty from that industry who are willing to come and teach in that program. We've already designed a state-of-the-art curriculum based on their input. Uh, they have that background knowledge, that new uh, experience with technology and resources in that discipline. So having them to come and teach in our program helps to ensure that that knowledge is transferred into the curriculum for our learners. So yes, that is a fantastic thing as well. And I'd just like to say that perhaps in a few years you could come back and give us a, uh, an update on, on, on how your students are doing and, and what they're working on. Thank we you. We would love to. 
if I can get Dr. McCoy past the funds part. He still is like, funds, yes, funds. <laughs> yes, but we would love to. Thank you. Any, anyone else? Oh, uh, Regent McMichael. Uh, uh, my question is, um, do we have a, enough cadavers to support such a program? Well, that's a wonderful question and, and something we considered quite early in developing the curriculum. But what we have is new technology, as, as Regent Carvello mentioned, that uh, simulates the cadaver experience. So we don't have to now go to uh, Loma Linda University where we were getting our ca cadavers from before, pay for them, and then pay for the transport, and then pay for the upkeep. upkeep. We actually have a SimDaver that simulates a uh, cadaver so that our learners can learn utilizing that technology. So we will be purchasing one for this. Pro we already have three, so we will be purchasing another one. And it has a special uh, software added to it that will assist with uh, dealing with or working with cadavers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Also, um, in this program, uh, is there consideration uh, for natural burial? It would be brought in by the individuals from the industry and would be a part of the discussion as it relates to the curriculum. So our learners would learn that aspect, all aspects of caring for the deceased. And not just the deceased, but there's a family member component as well. So you, you want to ensure that the family members are involved in what decisions need to be made related to their loved ones. So yes, those discussions would be had, sir. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, and I would just say, I think it's wonderful what uh, Regent Brown said, where the community's involved and you're filling a workforce need, and that's what we do. Yes. And I, I thought to myself, I didn't even know you were developing this program until I got the, you know, saw it on the agenda, and I'm thinking, what else is being um, put together out there we don't really know about that's fulfilling that need, because it is changing, and we know that demographic yes. cliff's coming, but... There's needs in our state. I don't think we need to have that cliff when, if we really looked at what we need to do for our state. so Well, the, the one thing about the School of Health Sciences is that we are very good about staying connected to our local community, our local community partners, and our employers. And so not only what the needs are for new programs, new courses of study, but what are the needs for new knowledge and experience and skills that our learners need in order to be gainfully employed and uh, um, professionals out there in the healthcare industry. So that's part of our advisory committee uh, that each of our programs have, and the funeral services program will have an advisory committee composed of individuals from the industry who would provide input into curriculum changes, revisions, technology, skill development, whatever is needed. So we, we always stay close to our local community for that very reason that you mentioned. We want to make sure that our learners are receiving the best quality educational experience uh, and working with the best quality equipment so that they can be absolutely prepared when they go out there into the workplace. Did that answer your question? Yes, it's, you guys, it's well thought out. So with that, I'll entertain a motion to approve the... Motion to approve. CSN. Second. AAS and Funeral Services. Motion by Regent McMichael. Second by Regent Brown. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion passes unanimously for the AAS and Funeral Services. So Wonderful. thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. And with that, we'll go on to item number four, TMCC, Program Proposal for Associate of Science and Psychology. And who's coming up for that one? Oh, okay. Mr. Albert. 
VP Good Alexander. morning, Chair Del Carlo, Regent members of the ARSA Committee, Presidents and colleagues. My name is Jeffrey Alexander, Vice President of Academic Affairs at Truckee Meadows Community College for the record. I come before you today to present our proposal to offer an Associate of Science degree in psychology. TMCC has long offered an Associate of Arts in psychology and it has two tracks, a BA track and a BS track. The former enables students to complete the coursework necessary to transfer to a BA psychology program and the latter enables students to complete coursework that substantially meets the requirements for the first two years of study for a psychology BS degree at UNR. Prior to proposing a new AS degree in psychology, we wanted to ensure that there were sufficient enrollment and matriculation from our BS track to avoid developing a program with low yield status. We are pleased to share that from fall 21 to spring 23, TMCC had 31 AA psychology degree earners who completed the BS track. Therefore, we seek approval to offer an AS in psychology for which our students are already completing the requisite coursework. As you know, Nevada's workforce is in great need of qualified mental health care professionals. Additionally, there is a significant shortage of applied behavior analysis providers or ABA providers throughout the state. An AS psychology degree will provide the pathway to UNR's two BS degree options in this field, psychological science and behavior analysis. These BS degree options prepare students for advanced study within psychology and or becoming an ABA provider. Transfer agreements are already in place between these two UNR BS degrees and TMCC's AA Psychology BS track. As our proposed AS Psychology will have the same curriculum, these transfer agreements will change in name only. Additionally, as our proposed degree will replace our existing BS track, our proposed program does not require new or additional planning, resources, or staffing at this time. I'd be very happy to take your questions and thank you for considering our proposal. Thank you, and with that, any committee members have a question or a comment? Or did you have your hand up? No, no, okay. Um, okay, with that, I would just say, um, once again, we're looking for workforce and mental health. We just heard a wonderful presentation, such a need, and I think with having one system really speeds and um, eases the process so everything's transferable it just that systemness is really a good thing so with that I will um, entertain a motion to approve the Associate of Science program proposal in psychology at TMCC motion to approve I have second. a motion from uh, Regent Brown and a second from Regent McMichael all in favor of the program proposal for Associate of Science in psychology please say aye Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Aye. No, good. And with that, it's passed unanimously, and thank you very much. Thank for you so much, Chair Del Carlo. Looking for, out for the need and streamlining. So with that, we'll go on to item number five, also TMCC, so you better stay right there. We have a program proposal for a Bachelor of Arts and Science in Radiological Technology. Yes, thank you, Chair Del Carlo and Regent members of the ARSA Committee. Once again, Jeffrey Alexander, Vice President of Academic Affairs at TMCC. For the record, I also come before you today to present our proposal to offer a Bachelor of Applied Science degree in radiologic technology. This degree will prepare graduates with the knowledge and skills necessary to be a successful imaging leader and an active member of a healthcare team. The proposed program emphasizes evidence-based practice, quality healthcare improvement, regulatory systems, patient safety, and equity. This BAS degree can be completed in 12 months and all courses will be offered online in eight week blocks. If approved, this program will be the only online distance education Bachelor of Applied Science Radiologic Technology degree in the NSHE system. The program will require all applicants to hold an associate degree in imaging from a regionally accredited institution and be registered with the American Registry of Radiologic Technologists. The online format will allow imaging professionals to pursue learning opportunities while working full time in our local community. This program will be a low cost option that enables students to stay in the area, enter the local workforce, and not have to leave their family or other obligations in order to earn a bachelor's degree in their field. 
Radiologic technologists are needed in hospitals, outpatient clinics, urgent care, surgery centers, medical sales, orthopedic specialties, higher education, and state regulatory agencies. The National Bureau of Labor Statistics lists Nevada as one of the highest paying states for radiologic technology with a 6% national job growth rate. The Healthcare can, uh, Careers Manual states that there are currently 1,330 radiologic technologists in the state and there were 980 job listings in 2021 and radiologic technologists are considered to be in high demand even still. The average sal state salary is $71,840 with a wage of around $35 per hour. The proposed program was discussed with our Radiologic Technology Program Advisory Board. The board advised the pro that the program could strengthen the current workforce and its sector leadership. And a graduate with a BAS in Radiologic te Technology can earn a higher wage or advance their career in professional development. The proposed program does not require any external specialized accreditation beyond our own accreditation with the Northwest Commission. And our AAS Radiologic Technology Program already has the faculty needed to teach toward the program. And the faculty possess a master's level education and are registered radiologic technologists. No new resources or staff uh, are needed to offer this new program at this time, but future program growth may warrant a hire of additional instructors. And with that, I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you for considering this proposal too. Thank you. And with that, do any committee members have, oh, Regent Brown, please. Hi, Regent Brown for the record. Um, and I'll take a little bit of uh, onus on this because I did not ask you before this meeting, but it is because I'm working with uh, Vice Chancellor Davis on understanding as a system, the implied degrees versus, you know, everything else. Um, so I was contacted by a couple of students who went in for uh, applied degrees and then decided, oh, you know, they were told, you know, they went in for a workforce degree, right? And then they were told that, hey, if you spend two more years, you can actually make X, much, X amount of more money. And they're like, you know what? I'm really enjoying this. I'm gonna stay as a student, great experience. And then went on to, to move and they lost a lot of the, a lot of the um, credits didn't actually transfer. So my only hesitation, and as a, as a system, we haven't addressed this and, and the workforce committee will do it later this year. Um, how many of these credits will not transfer if these students decide to go on to a Bachelor of Science? And is there, yeah, yeah I'll ask that question first. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent DeCarlo, to, to you and through you to Regent Brown. Uh, that is an excellent question. In this case, uh, the associate degree, the uh, uh, Associate of Applied Science degree credits will transfer in full and be count toward the Bachelor of Applied Science. We're very excited about that. Uh, the problem that you've identified does in some cases uh, rear its head when we talk about other kinds of bachelors of applied science programs. Uh, I believe there's uh, some uh, discussion uh, later today in this meeting about uh, the number of gen ed credits that sometimes are required uh, because there are some inconsistencies in policy and board policy about that and I believe we're trying to address that. We've had discussions about that of late because we do wish to ensure that every credit that a student earns towards an applied uh, associate degree will transfer to the bachelor's degree. In some parts of board policy, it says that someone could transfer to a different institution and be a junior in good standing right away upon completion of that associate degree. In other parts of board policy, it does not say that. And so we need to remedy that and rectify that inconsistency in policy because we do wish to ensure that every student who, if you will permit the analogy, wants to take a connecting flight across the country can connect and expect to board the next flight on time and not be left without any credits or you know, perhaps didn't have enough points, if you will, to, to board the next flight, we want to ensure that they can. And so in this case, uh, the program uh, faculty have developed the new BAS program specifically to enable those who completed the associate degree, whether at TMCC or GBC, for example, to enter the Bachelor of Applied Science and do that online. Certainly. Go ahead, um, thank Brown. you so much for being thoughtful and, and making sure that these students will be taken care of if they do decide to stay. I think it is so important. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I feel very grateful that I was made the chair of the workforce committee and I learned, I've been learning so much over the last two months and, and it is actually insane to me how many gaps there are in, in different degrees. Um, you know, it is, it is not setting students up for success if we put them into an applied degree and then they decide to continue on and then they're 40 credits behind. Um, 
a lot of times those are our most vulnerable students. So I'm glad to see that this won't be a problem here. And, and I just want to, for the record, say that everyone in the system office has been so wonderful at educating me and, and acknowledging the fact that there are gaps in, and being proactive. This is not something that has been passive. Um, I just being a new, new, fairly new regent, um, I'm learning about this. And so I wanted to make sure I asked it. And so thank you for, for addressing that ahead of time. Thank you so much. Thank you, and your points are well taken because I agree, everything should transfer. I mean, you shouldn't lose credits. I mean, it's time and money and the sooner you can get out in the workforce, you're contributing to our tax base, for one. Any other questions from the committee? Anyone else? Okay, with that, I'll entertain a motion for approval for the um, TMCC's program proposal for a Bachelor's of Applied Science in Radiological Technology. Motion to approve. Okay, thank you, second. Regent Brown. Uh, second from Regent McMichael. All those in favor of approving the TMCC program proposal, Bachelor's of Applied Science in Radiological Technology, please say aye. 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 Anybody uh, oppose? Okay, with that... It passes unanimously, and I do want to say within, we have three, this morning we had three new program proposals that all passed, and on our cycle within our, so within three years, you will all be back to give us an update on how those are going, so I do look forward to that. We certainly will. Thank you, Chair Del Carlo and Regent members. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll go on to item number six, the 2024 Regent Awards. And I will turn that over to, I think it's our, let me get your title right, Vice Chancellor of Academics, Academics and Student Affairs. Perfect. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Got it right. Thank you. Daniel Archer. Thank Dr. You. Daniel morning, Archer. Uh, Daniel Archer for the record here. So we have a variety of Regents Awards for faculty, staff, and students. So I'm going to read um, each award title along with the nominee or nominees. Um, first is the Sam Lieberman Regents Award for Student Scholarship, Zachary Balot from UNLV for undergraduate category, Alix Bunyard from TMCC, Sarah Cruz from GBC, Alessandro Rawls from UNR, graduate student, Alexander Rankin from NSU, Susanna Stan Cudi from WNC, Rebecca Taylor from CSN, Amelia Terry from UNLV, graduate student. Michael Woodruff from UNR, undergraduate student. Next award is Nevada Regents Outstanding Classified Staff Award, and that is uh, Sunny Remniff from UNR. Next award is Nevada Regents Award for Creative Activities, Community College. That's Mark Maynard from TMCC. Next award is Nevada Regents Award for Creative Activities University slash DRI, and that is Peter Gowen from UNR. Next award is Nevada Regents Teaching Award Tenured, Tenure Track Community College, that's Dr. Megan Gray. Next award is Nevada Regents Teaching Award Non-Tenured University slash DRI, and that is uh, Dr. Anne Marie Bolstedt from UNR. Next award is Nevada Regents Teaching Award Tenure Track uh, University DRI, and that is Dr. Caitlin Clinton from UNLV. Next award is Nevada Regents Academic Advisor Award Community College, and that is uh, Jolena Adams from GBC. Next award is the Nevada Regents Academic Advisor Award University slash DRI. Um, John Starkey from UNLV, and then Dr. Carrie Ryan from UNR. Next award is the Nevada Regents Researcher Mid-Career University slash DRI. And that is uh, Jo Ling Wang, Dr. Jo Ling Wang from DRI. Next award is the Nevada Regents Researcher Award Distinguished University slash DRI. And that is uh, Dr. Bing Zhang from UNLV. Next award is Nevada Regents Rising Researcher Award. We have uh, Gabrielle Boisarami from DRI. And then Gabriela Dos Santos de Buccini from UNLV. Dr. Joshua Island from UNLV, Dr. Austin Hong in Wong from UNLV, Dr. El Heshmi Buhali from NSU, Dr. Elizabeth V. 
Le Lobos from UNR, Dr. Hamad Ibrahim Himian from UNR, Dr. Jessica Parks from NSU, Dr. Catherine Dockweiler from NSU, and last but not least, Dr. Lee Lee from UNR. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Archer, for, for saying the names publicly. And when I was at the Nevada, Northern Nevada Diversity Summit, I did attend the uh, session on what's in a name. And I know we all want to have our names said publicly, properly, and when we're talked to properly. So I appreciate the effort you made to say everybody's names correctly, because we, we did have some of them phonetically. So that, that's really great. And um, I think it's wonderful that we have these awards, and these awards are just not given. They're, they're really vetted well, and um, everyone here is this very deserving, and I know it becomes a, um, a, a very point of pride in your career when you get these different types of awards. So with that, I'd like to ask for a round of applause for all the um, <laughs> awardees. Thank you so much for that. And Interim Chancellor uh, Charlton, yes. Thank you, Chair Del Carlo, and for the record, Patty Charlton, Interim Chancellor. So I just really wanted to also acknowledge the heavy lift and all of the support that the institutions provided to this process. Um, the uh, the nomination process is is very significant, and then also all of the work that goes behind the scenes between the committees that review all of the uh, considerations, as well as the staff that that supports that. It is a lot, and it is one of the most important things that we do. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. You're correct. It's very rigorous, and um, it's prideful for all of us. So with that, this is an action item. So I uh, will entertain a motion to approve the awards. Motion to approve. Uh, I had second. a motion from Regent Brown and a second from Regent Cruz Crawford. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? How could you be opposed? Uh, that passes unanimously. So thank you very much. And with that, we'll go on. Chair. To, uh, yes, Re uh, Regent Cruz Crawford. I just wanted to add something. I know the motion already passed, but um, I've been working with um, Dr. Dockweiler at NSU. Um, I actually met her a few years ago. I was writing an education pathway piece of legislation. She's like, can my school psychologists get on that? Because we need dual language. A bilingual school psychologist before we can get any students that have a second language um, tested into special ed. And now she's working on career pathways for counselors and a lot of mental health professionals that's really going to impact our state based on the previous um, meeting. So I just wanted to celebrate her. Thank you. And I will add to that because we've never met, but she testified. I'm on the Nevada Advisory Committee for uh, the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, and, and she testified on uh, school, how many school psychologists we have in Nevada when we were working on one of our reports. So is she here today? Well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Molly. <laughs> that, yeah, so I'll meet her hopefully in the future on your campus. So with that, we go to item number seven. It's a handbook revision, a revision um, on system general ed education requirements. And with that, we'll go back to Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs, Dr. Daniel Archer. Thank you again. Again, Daniel Archer for the record. Um, so we have two undergraduate degrees that are explicitly designed for workforce purposes. Obviously, we got into this discussion a little bit earlier when Dr. Alexander was up here. Um, so they are applied degrees in both name and function. Uh, one is the Associate of Applied Science, the other is the uh, Bachelor of Applied Science. Again, uh, these are designed with the workforce in mind here. So compared to an Associate in Arts or a Bachelor of Arts degree, there's less general education. There's more program-specific content because we're preparing these students for a, a specific career. So the proposed revisions create a common general education framework for both of these degrees. Uh, so the same 18-hour general education framework will apply to both the Associate of Applied Science degree and the Bachelor of Applied Science degree. So 
This will do a few things that will create um, system consistency and ensure that we are kind of speaking the same language and playing ball by the same rules. Uh, it'll also create a framework that facilitates a transfer process for students who complete the Associate of Applied Science degree and wish to pursue a, a Bachelor of Applied Science degree. And uh, thirdly, it'll create a framework that allows applied science degrees to, to place a stronger emphasis on uh, workforce uh, needs. That concludes my presentation. Okay. Answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. And I hear workforce needs. That's music to my ears and to Regent Brown's ears. Any questions from the committee? Okay, thank you, Regent Brown. Hi, Regent Brown, for the record. Um, and we're basically just trying to set a framework. So if a, a different institution wants to bring apply, uh, an applied degree, it, it will actually fit this formula, right? Like it, that there isn't a chance that it could be associated with a different uh, two or four year degree. And so we don't mess students up when they're actually trying to enter uh, an NG institution. Right, in the event that there is a applied baccalaureate degree, there would be a clear pathway that would work and would function and ensure that credits transfer and apply. Because I understand that not everything needs a, a degree, right? Like right. We, we've acknowledged as a, as a society, you, know, right. you don't need a degree for everything. Coming into an entry institution, you get the wraparound services, you can go for the applied degrees and you can go into the workforce. Um, but if we're going to set them up for success, if there is an opportunity, we're at least going to build it so the transfer, yeah. and this is acknowledging that. Right. Okay. Yep. Thank you so much. Any other questions from the committee or any other regents? And this also is an action item, so I will entertain a motion to a handbook revision on system general education requirements. Motion to approve. Thank second. you, Regent Brown, and a second from Regent McMichael. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay, thank you. A motion second and carried for the handbook revision on system general education requirements, and thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Archer. And yes, you've got to stay right up there. We're going on to item number eight. It's the ENCHI data dashboards, and... I know he's no longer on the committee, but I know this is one that is near and dear to Regent Arascada's heart. And um, this is wonderful information, so I'm looking forward to this presentation. Thank you. You have the floor. And I think we had a short PowerPoint for this. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So uh, just some background on this. Again, this is Daniel Archer for the record. Our institutional research department is commonly referred to as IR. Um, it's comprised of Jose Martinez and Sarah Echo. Um, so we have two people doing all the work at the system level here just to provide some perspective on this. Um, I most recently worked in Kansas. I was at the Kansas Board of Regents for the last five and a half years. And we had a dozen full-time employees working in IR at the system office there. So two versus 12 for a state that's a pretty similar population. So um, our NCI IR crew is, is definitely a mean, lean fighting machine, and they, they put out some really good work. Been very impressed with what they're able to do with the limited staffing. Um, just to provide some, some background on some of the things they do, obviously they help out with legislative requests when a legislature wants data, or when a legislator, excuse me, wants data, or you as a board member want data, they're the ones doing that work behind the scenes, putting it together. They help us with policy changes. Uh, they really play an invaluable role in our day-to-day -day operations here. Uh, most of the work that they do, of course, is behind the scenes, but uh, one of the things that is more front-facing is the data dashboard. Um, anyone who has internet access or is able to access this doesn't require any special permissions or passwords or anything like that. Um, these data primarily come from four sources here. Uh, the first is data that comes directly from our institutions in the NCHI Student Data Warehouse. So that's something we collect. And the second is Nevada Statewide Longitudinal Data System. This allows us to connect data with our K-12 counterpart, uh, the Nevada Department of Education. And the third is the Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System, otherwise known as IPADS, which is the data that's reported to the United States Department of Education. And the fourth is the National Student Clearinghouse which is a nonprofit reporting and research organization uh, that about 97% of public college universities are reporting into. That's becoming a very mainstream uh, way of um, reporting and, and, and sharing data, receiving data. So um, 
a couple other things here. Uh, here are the data points that are available, um, and you are able to look at these by system uh, or by tier or by individual institution. Uh, so we have a variety of access, success, completion, and employment metrics here. Um, our newest addition here is the co-requisite outcomes, which we're going to talk about tomorrow, so just a little preview of that. Um, so last November when we convened, uh, those of you all that are on the committee remember that Jose Martinez covered some of the, the federal reported data elements here. Uh, today he's going to drive us through some of the data that comes from the other three sources here. So I'm going to turn it over to Jose. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Archer. Um, good morning, um, Jose Martinez for the record. I'm the uh, NCIR director and I am here to do a demonstration on the data, data dashboards. Um, to access that information, you may uh, find it uh, by going to the NC data website and, sorry, the NC website under system administration and by clicking on the data center, that should take you to um, the, in a brief description of the NC um, IR website and what information is available. Um, you might see the links here and also other reports that we have available. Um, for the data dashboards, um, by clicking on the institutional research, you should be able to see a landing page where, where you will see um, a brief description of the dashboards that are available as well as other data um, that you may be familiar with. For example, if you click on the enrollment, this should give you a description or, or a summary of the FTE and headcount um, reports that are available, which your institutions report at the end of the semester. Um, and this is just uh, the, the most recent um, nine or, um, sorry, nine years uh, of data. Um, but there's also historical data that goes back to 2006. Um, and this is all, again, it's state funded. Uh, for courses that are state funded, uh, you'll see the uh, FTE and headcount by institution in those reports, but in here is just a summary. You can also find the uh, nursing enrollment, which is uh, state supported for the summer uh, semesters, and there is also the historical data that you can have access to. Going to the dashboards, um, I'd like to clarify that these dashboards are better viewed on screens that are bigger than a knife, um, a cell phone, so a tablet or higher. Uh, otherwise, you will not be getting the, the, um, all of the features um, that were meant for you to see. So uh, here at the top, if you see the data and dashboards on the blue bar, um, if you click on it, it'll list all of the dash dashboards that we have made publicly available. Um, I will cover all of these ones with iPads at the beginning of the name at, at la last. So to look at the college readiness dashboard, and this is um, Region Arisqueta's favorite um, dashboard because it is the pipeline of our high school graduates. Um, and this, uh, we can tell the story of all of the high school graduates and, and their uh, continuation to post-secondary education or, or even to the workforce. Um, from here, you'll see um, definitions, uh, methodology that we use to um, prepare the data available in these dashboards. Um, and please, by all means, um, do spend some time with this because you do need to um, go over the data at your, at your own pace in order to get all of the information that we provide. Um, so if you click on the high school graduates tab, it'll give you the um, summary of those um, students that have graduated with a standard advanced alternative and college and career ready diploma types from our high schools in Nevada going back to 2012-2013 um, cl graduation class years. Um, one of the features on these dashboards is if you browse over the uh, data 
points, you should see um, the number and also the percentage uh, representation of those uh, diploma types um, for the high schools that have graduated from pu public high, school, high schools in the state. The next tab is the high school graduates continuation. And this is um, the, uh, the basically at the pipeline. What students we are capturing that go to, um, to entry institutions. We also have information on when uh, the students that do not attend uh, entry institutions, they transfer to another state or even private institutions within Nevada. Um, similar thing, if, if those students did not attend a post-secondary education, we can tell that they are employed in Nevada. Um, for clarification, in, uh, employed in Nevada, um, we use the employment insurance uh, data from the Department of Employment Training and Rehabilitation. Um, this data does not include self-employed um, individuals or gig worker um, individuals. So it is not the complete picture, but we have some information of those um, students that graduate from high school but do not continue to post-secondary education. And lastly, we have those that we don't know what happens to them. Um, they could be working out of state, um, but because we don't have employment data for other states other than Nevada, we don't know if they are in the workforce at those states. <clears throat> the next uh, tab will focus on the students that we do capture, uh, which is the blue um, color section in this chart. Um, if you click on the entry capture rate, you'll see the percentage of those students that graduate from Nevada high schools that continue to ENCHI. And as you can see over time, the last three years, that capture rate has declined. Uh, we don't know why. Um, that's another you know, report that we can start looking at to see what, why we are not capturing more of those students. But with the data that we have, as you can see, if you hover over the data elements, you can see additional information um, for all of those high school graduates. And, the, and that is the number of, of students that continue to NG. And by clicking on the data element, you'll get a breakdown of where those graduates go into an NG institution, or which NG institution they, they, they continue their post-secondary education. Um, Again, uh, for disclosure, if a student attends UNLV and NSU, it's gonna be counted once at each institution, so this may be a duplicated count. Um, however, the NG column, this is unduplicated, so one student going to more than one institution is only counted once. And when you click on this, sorry, let me take it back. So at the bottom of the chart, you should see the uh, footnote that tells you that this chart has different levels. Right now we're on level two of four. So if you keep, keep clicking on those columns, it'll give you the breakdown of those graduates by diploma type, by race and ethnicity, attending at that institution. And the last data point is the um, longitudinal trend for that specific race and ethnic group um, over time. The last three is, shows data on those high school graduates that have uh, or took the ACT score and enrolled at an ENCHI institution. And this is the average of all of those students that attended ENCHI within the year following high school graduation. Uh, I, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this and I do ask that you take your time and, and go over the data at your own pace. Uh, the next um, dashboard is uh, this report that we created um, to meet the, the requirements for the NRS statute uh, or the Nevada Re Revised Statute 396531, which is um, a report to the uh, director of the legislative um, legislature every Feb February 1st of the odd numbers uh, number, numbered year. Um, on this one, we track students that enter a program and track their completion or time to completion. 
So as you can see from here, from this um, drop-down menu, you can select those students that enter the uh, institution during that semester <laughs> and the time that it takes to graduate. Um, and you have the options to select by institution, by degree type, and also by the um, CIP program or the, um, uh, sorry, the um, uh, field of study. The next item is, uh, well, prerequisites, and this will be covered in more detail by Vice Chancellor Archer in his presentation. Um, the other new, newest dashboard that we have is the student transfer, which we looked at students that declare a transferable degree during the uh, listed semester, full semester, how many of those transfer with an associates and their progression to either um, transfer to a four-year institution, and if they transfer to a four-year institution, did they complete a bachelor's degree? Um, and there is all of that information. Uh, the functionality of this dashboard, if you see at the bottom, there is um, the, the fall 2015 data, but if you click on another year, you should change this data for that semester that you selected. And as you can see, for the most recent years, there is not enough data because there is not enough years for those students to complete credits or, or transfer and, and earn associates or bachelors. So now to the uh, IPEDS data dashboards. If you, if you have not seen those dashboards since last week, this will look a lot different than what they look back then. Uh, we made this dashboard more user-friendly and it allows you to interact more with the data and the data elements within each of those dashboards. <clears throat> so to start, we have the institution, uh, institutions award conferred degrees. Uh, this is the number of um, degrees that, that are awarded during, uh, during an academic year. And if you can see over time, the number has has grown, but for this dashboard, you, you also have the ability to, to um, show the data by gender, by race and ethnicity, and the award level. And if you select a different institution, you should see the data for that institution as well. Um, if you notice, for the universities, you have the professional awards and the grad level awards, but when you select the two-year institutions, you'll see the degrees that are offered and, and awarded at those institutions. So this is a longitudinal view of that data. For in the awards confer plus filters, and this one is where you're allowed to interact more with the data. Um, we have dimensions which allows you to compare or group data based on these data elements. So if you select the no grouping and just do um, select NG, you should see basically the same information that you see when this page loads. But when you start applying filters, then you can start narrowing and literally fil filtering down to all of these data elements. So you can select by male students, that are, you know, have two races or more, um, that earn associates, and you click on the show data, you should see the summary of those um, students that meet that criteria and the awards that were awarded to those students. I also included um, data on, on the IPEDS dashboard uh, for the awards conferred. Uh, so you should have the definitions if you have questions of what's included in this dashboard. The, um, the format for all of the other dashboards is pretty similar to it. If we move to the employee headcount, uh, and by the way, you can also access the dashboards by going here, and when you're in the iPads dashboards, you should have other quick links in here that would allow you to just click and, and switch um, dashboards from one to the other one. So looking at the employee headcount, you also have the ability to change the institution or just look at it all system-wide. 
Um, you have the same abilities to filter this data by gender, race, ethnicity, and also for, by the uh, employment status. Yes. Uh, yes, Regent uh, Cruz Crawford, do you want to ask a question? On the um, Regent Cruz Crawford, for the record, thank you, Chair. Um, on the employee headcount, <clears throat> um, is there retention rates on here, or is it just current? This is just uh, current at a, sorry, uh, Jose Martinez, for the record. Uh, uh, this is uh, headcount at the point in time when the data was reported. Is there any data dashboard that shows retention? Uh, we do not have one currently, no. Would it be a possibility? I could request a new business, but I just wanted to know, is there something out there that other uh, we can systems are using? We can work with you if you're interested in, in that to get the definitions and, and understanding of what you would like to see. Okay, perfect. I'll say that in new business. Thank you. And... Um, to continue with the, with the dashboard, uh, for the employee headcount, uh, at the December board meeting, Regent um, Perkins uh, requested, oh, sorry, did that not work? Thank you. Apologies for that. Um, uh, Regent Perkins requested data on, on or, or having the ability to filter and, and get data on, on the staff function and occupation based on, on race, ethnicity, or any other data element that we can possibly filter with this. Uh, so what we did with, with the data was, again, similar format, you select, in this case, you select this, the staff function and occupation. You look at or select the institution that you would like, and you can apply any of these filters, and by clicking on the show data, it'll give you the historical data for all of those primary functions and occupations for um, the employees that meet that criteria. So if you want to see female um, full-time Asian employees, you should be able to filter down to, to that level of um, the occupation and primary function. But in addition, you can also make comparisons. So if you want to see what the data looks like for gender across entry institutions, you can see that data as well. And this will give you the uh, summary over time. Um, and because in some of the metrics, the values overlap, um, they show up with no values, but you can select the uh, show value option so you can see what, what the values are for, those, um, for that data point in time. And you can also interact with, with, the, with the chart to, to display and show those uh, measures. And again, there is an about IPEDS human resources dashboard that it'll tell you what, it, what, what employees are included in this count and, what, and who is not included in this report, as well as the definitions that are um, included, uh, what employees are included in each of those categories. <clears throat> The next um, dashboard is the um, fall enrollment. Again, similar setup. Um, you can interact with it by pulling data on gender, race, enrollment load, and the age group. Uh, this particular one I, I found it interesting because depending on the institution level or the, even the institution, you can see that over time, the, the group of 17 and younger is increasing. Uh, for example, if we look at Nevada State University, you can see that for the th past three years, the number of students 17 and younger, and this is due to the dual enrollment program, um, it has increased. And now that group is the majority compared to even students that are 18 to 21 and those that are 22 to 24. And for that matter, all of the other ones. Um, so you can see the representation of that data. And you can interact with this chart by clicking on, on this um, 
legend elements. And lastly, one of these other ones is the data is also separated or broken down by undergrad and graduate students. Um, you can see that for our four-year institutions. There is undergrad and graduate level. Oh, that's the same one, sorry. So there is the number of uh, graduate students and undergrad. Similar functionality, uh, there is a dimension options that you can select to group the data. Um, if you would like to see enrollment by race and ethnicity for all of the ENCHI institutions. This uh, will provide the information for those that are white versus historically minoritized student population. Uh, you can also add the values, but like I said, in some of those, the data will overlap. So that's why they, when the data shows, the, the numbers are hidden. But if you wanted to see, you can click on the show data and you can also add more race and ethnic, ethnic categories to the dashboard. Uh, and you can isolate that, and you can, you can isolate a, a, those race categories so you can see what the data looks like. And by changing the institution, you can get that information for that institution that you select. Did it, oh, sorry, the same thing. There is the an about iPads fall enrollment. That way you get information on what is included and the, what the definitions of those categories that are used in, in that data. The next um, dashboard is the graduation rates. And this is the one that has changed the most because in the past we would just show the rate. Now you are able to see the students that are in the cohort those that completed within 150% of normal time and the rate. And, and again, you also have the ability to filter and get the data by, by institution. And you can also interact with the chart. So if you just wanna see how many students were in the cohort, you can do that by clicking on the data elements uh, in the legend. So you can see the trend for students in the cohort completers, and the graduation rate. Again, same options. You get a gender, you, and in this, with the gender, you get the male and female, as well as the institution rate, so you can compare where each of those groups fall either under or above the graduation rate for the institution. You see the race and ethnicity, and this one you also have the ability to add and interact with the chart by adding those um, categories. As you can see, some of these categories, some, some of these categories have so low or, or few students that it can fluck, uh, any changes in the data can, can show um, great percentage or very poor performance. Um, as you can see, for example, at Great Basin, black students in the cohort were two, and two of them graduated, so it looks like 100%, so it's great, but also when you look at um, students, Asian students, there's only five and two completed. That rate looks low, but it's due to the low N. And you can do that too, with all of the uh, ethnic categories. One uh, other feature that was improved on this dashboard is the, um, uh, our two-year institution's mission is to pre not just to graduate students, but also to prepare students to transfer. So if you look in here, if you select any of our four-year institutions, you only get three options. You get the all gender and race and ethnicity. But when you move to uh, one of the, uh, our two-year institutions, you get this option, which is the graduation plus the transfer out rate. Transfer out rate. So, this is basically the same rate that you would see here. But in this one, you also see the transfer out. And you see the number of those students in the cohort that transferred out and also those that completed within 100% of normal time. To the next tab, again, same features. You, you get the dimension optioned 
which you can select not to group, and that basically will give you whatever you saw on the uh, longitudinal data. But if you wanted to compare what the graduation, re graduation rate is for, by gender, by institution, and you can also select ethnicity, um, that'll give you the comparison of that, uh, the dimension option that you selected. And again, you also see the values, so you see what, uh, what the rate is, and in addition to that, you get to see the number in the cohort and those that completed within 150% of normal time. And just like the other dashboards, there is a, an about dashboard information that tells you what the 150% uh, includes, the transfer out rate, the graduation rate plus transfer out rate, and what institutions are included in the four-year and the two-year category. And there's also links that will take you to the IPEDS um, survey so you can get more, inf more detailed information on what is included, and that, that link, um, there is also a link available for each of those um, dashboards. Um, before I move to the next one, and this is um, back in June of last year, um, our two-year inst uh, two institution's presidents mm -hmm. shared their frustration and, and, and their um, dislike of using graduation rates because it does not represent the students at those institutions. Um, for, because of that, um, and, and this is not new to our institutions. Um, this has happened over, it, it has been a, a concern for the two-year institutions for over a decade. Uh, and for that reason, IPEDS implemented the outcome measures, which is the most recent um, dashboard, or sorry, the, the most recent survey that it was implemented by IPEDS, and, and it was to address those concerns. And as you can see in this graph, for this metric, uh, for this survey, uh, IPEDS collects data on first time and not first time. So for the first time, this is your, your students that have not had any post-secondary education and your non-first time transfer ins, these are the students that are new to the reporting institution. So these students may have come in from another institution having completed already credits, so they have credits under their belt, but this is the first time that they attend that reporting institution. And that data is disaggregated by full-time and part-time, as well as if, that, if any of those students received a Pell Grant or did not receive a Pell Grant. I, I yes. have a question on this one, Jose. Mm -hmm. um, so this was as a result of requests by our community college presidents, I think you're saying? Yes. Right, and so you created this. I started working on this back in June, yes. And so I would say to our community college presidents, is this giving you the data you feel is um, reflective of what you are asking for? Is this what, and, and is this a valuable tool now for you? Uh, Dr. Z, I'm going to put you on the spot and start with you. It's moving in the right direction. I think that there's still issues for us at, at the macro level. Uh, one with iPad as a data source itself, uh, there's uh, significant information gaps and time gaps at times. Uh, so when you're looking at the information, you almost have to put it in the context of what, what period are we talking about. Uh, the other element that, that for us, uh, for me, uh, has always been a consideration is that when we have as many part-time students as we have, the three-year window is giving you a snapshot, uh, a better window, and, uh, and nationally you're seeing a lot of this at the six-year window uh, because your part-time students take longer to graduate. Uh, so again, I, I think it, it, it's much better. I think it's recognizing the diversity of our students, but this space, as long as it's iPad data, uh, I, I would suggest you know, we need to look at it with a grain of salt, but also uh, do understand that th this is a, a definite move forward based on where we've been in the past. Thank you. Um, President Hilgerson, I know you're a driver of this. Yes, and I, first of all, thank you for listening and for making some changes. I really appreciate it. I would uh, concur with my colleague, Dr. Zaragoza. It's a move in the right direction, <laughs> but I really think we, we need to start fresh and look at some of the practices that some of uh, colleges are doing in our country. We should also look at the uh, uh, scorecard that the Department of Ed at the federal level 
uh, posts very publicly. It's a very simple thing that could be easily replicated here. Uh, so, so I think we sort of need to uh, think creatively. Uh, maybe I would recommend get the two, predominantly two-year college presidents together with NSHE to collaborate and to have a nice thorough discussion about what might work and how we can fund it. I do think the IR team at NSHE is going to need more help uh, maybe additional staff in order to really get what will tell our story. Uh, we, we're just not telling our story in a way that can get us more friends <laughs> out there. And it, it's particularly in terms of funding for two-year colleges. The other th simple thing I would recommend is on many of the dashboards we're seeing today, there's really not a clear definition offered of the cohort. For example, a few minutes ago, I, was, I wasn't clear if I was looking at a cohort of first-time, full-time iPads. I did, so I think the definition of who is in the co cohort needs to also appear on the dashboard. Because again, we probably get it because we're the ed experts. But if a, if a public official looks at this, they are making a lot of assumptions that are very, very false. Uh, other than, wow, that's a really small cohort size. I thought TMCC had 10,000 students. Well, we do approximately. So why are there only, you know, a couple of hundred students in this, in this graph? I mean, the, the typical person who isn't in it, in, in the data, doesn't understand that. So I think it's our job to at least communicate that on the website. Thank you. Thank you, President Hagerson. President mm -hmm. Dalpy? Yeah, so I'll piggyback on some of those comments, Kyle Delby, for the record, Western. Um, one of the things that we look at with the iPads and the graduation rate is always the first-time, full-time student, which is quite the opposite, has been said by my colleagues, um, of what we do at a community college. And so the community college piece of students who are not first-time, are not going to be full-time, being able to drill down to any of these dashboards, however we tweak them with definitions, make them look look uh, different and can drill down and look at that data to tell our story is very important. When we walk into the legislature and we say things like 42% graduation rate, which is where we are, which will be the highest we've had in a while, is a really good number. The legislators will look at us and say, why are you not at 100%? And the reason is because it is a very small cohort where if students opt out of the data set, they count against us and new students are not added in for that particular graduation rate. So being able to bring a sheet that says, uh, other other indicators of success, even if it's a student coming in and saying, I needed to learn Excel, I got that, and now I've got a job increase. To me, that's a success, and that's an indicator we should be using in all of our metrics. And so, again, I appreciate the work that the group has done up at ENSHI. Happy to work with them. They support us quite a bit because we have a very small IR office. We have an FTE of one who is split five different ways. So I appreciate your help with, with Chris and crew over there and everything that we're doing on the inside. But anything we can do to, to put the data points and drill down like these charts are showing um, is, is very much appreciated by a small school and as president to be able to tell our story. Thank you. Thank you. And President Helens, please. Thank you. Joyce Helens, for the record, uh, president, Great Basin College. Regent Del Carlo, you know that I concur with my colleagues because I feel like a broken record. I've brought this up at every metrics presentation. So first of all, I do want to say thank you because we have been heard and we do have a ways to go. But even to say and recognize one size does not fit all is important. And now we go from there because although we will always be very proud of a 50% graduation rate, that still represents a very small group of first time, full time. And we really want to be able, as uh, President Helgerson has said, when we look at our part time students, we're not trying to fit them into our methods. We're trying to reach out to them. Well, I don't want to say you're a failure because you haven't graduated in three years because they have full time jobs and families and so forth. So thank you for recognizing that one size does not fit all. And we'll move on from there. Thank you to the presidents, because um, that's what this committee really should be doing, working with IR to get the information that you need to tell the right story. And I, I totally agree. One size does not fit all. And um, with that, Jose, keep, thank you for that interruption, because that, that sure. was important to hear thank from you. our presidents. Um, and, and to President Hilgerson's comments, uh, every, every one of these dashboards has a link to the IPITS to their respective survey, and it does show what cohort is included, who is included, how they are counted. So there is a lot of definitions that I could not go over during the presentation, but the link is included in all of those dashboards. Um, there is even Q&As and, and tutorials on how to use the data and report the data. So there is definitions in there. So I, 
encourage you all to click on those links and, and look at the definitions to learn more of who is included in there. Um, but going back to the outcome measures, um, again, this is a problem that IPEDS did acknowledge and recognize that it was an issue because graduation rates only includes those that are first time, full time. With these outcome measures, it looks at full time and part time for those that, are, that come in first time to the institution and also those that attended other institutions that transfer into the reporting institution. Um, and to continue with that data, this, um, this metric will show who is in that population. So, population, so basically who is in these all entering groups. Um, and, and this is under, by institutions, by trend. So if you look in here, um, and you can interact with the chart by selecting or clicking on the data elements or the legend, you can see who uh, the number that is in that, uh, in that cohort. Um, and as you know, UNLV and CSN, those are our largest institutions. But when you look at TMCC, in TMCC has by far the largest student population that comes in either as new or transferring to the institution, which I was surprised to see that number, especially when comparing to the other institutions, that number is just enormous. Uh, and that is to the point of President Hilgerson that yes, graduation rate does not represent this, the, the, uh, the uh, mission of the, of the institution. And this is clearly why, because uh, the majority of these students are part-time. Um, the other function in this dashboard is Again, going back to the first time, full time, and non first time, full time, part time, um, when you select one of the institutions, in this case, all entry institutions, you see the data broken down by those that are first time, full time, and first time, part time, as well as those that are non first time, you are transferring students that are full time, and same students, non first time, transferring part time. And you can see the uh, proportion of that, of that student population. One thing in here that you can also look is at the values. And you can see that by, by in large, all of the four-year institutions, or actually the majority of the institutions, the first time, whether it's full-time or part-time, are larger than those that are transferring first-time and part-time. Uh, and you can see that by changing the, uh, the institutions, the only two institutions where that is not the case is Nevada State where the part-time or the transferring students is larger than those that are first time, but it is more significant for TMCC. So if you click on the values, you see that just the non-first time transferring part-time alone, it's, lar it's bigger than the other three groups combined. So yes, when looking at graduation rates, now keep in mind that this is any student that entered the institution between July 1st and June 30th of the following year. So it doesn't include just fall like it does for um, graduation rates, but it includes uh, everyone that came in in the spring or even the summer. Um, so that is the student population. So in the graduation rate, only a fraction of these students are represented. So we are excluding all of these other ones, which for TMCC, it's 90% or more. Uh, one of the features in this dashboard as well is if you notice when you click on, or when you hover over the um, data element at the bottom, you'll see click on this section to view award and enrollment status. So on this one, if you click on it, you will see the, the flow of those students that entered that in, the, the institution, uh, in this case is TMCC, of those, how many earn a degree at four years? And of those that do not earn a degree at four years, there is the, uh, the, the path and the continuation for those. So you can see that those that did not earn an award at four years, 69 of those, at six years, they earn a degree. So now there's a total of 259 students that earn a degree at six years. And then there's the continuation. Those that did not earn a degree at four years and also did not earn a degree at six years, what happens to them 
after eight years. Um, and you can see there is an additional group that earn a degree at eight years, those that are still enrolled at the time when this report, when the data was reported, those that are, in, that are known to be enrolled at another institution, and those where the status is unknown. And if you see, this is first time full-time student cohort for those that came in in 2009, 2010. Um, if you move to a more recent year, you can also look at that by year. So it doesn't look at just at 150% of normal time, but it looks at an eight year point in time and the enrollment status and award status for that cohort. And you can do that for all of the, all of the institutions. It'll show you the, the path and the flow of, the, of that completion and the status uh, for, for that cohort. The other two metrics that we have here, again, similar, there is a dif the dimension option. Uh, if we were to just look at no grouping by entry institution, you can also narrow down to look at only students that are first time or transfer in or just look at the entire student population. Uh, you can look at full time and part time and if they receive a Pell Grant or not. So when you click on that, you see the comparison um, or, or the longitudinal data, and you can see that for those that came in in 2009, 2010, um, earn a degree, um, let me see, earn a degree at four years, or, or the percentage of those that earn a degree at four years, at six years, and even at eight years. And if you noticed on this, um, uh, the tooltip, uh, when you hover on the, on the uh, eight-year metric, at the very bottom, you'll see the, the cumulative total of those that earn an award at eight years. So in this case, it's um, 12,000 students out of the 42,199. Um, that number, or 28% of that is those students that earn a degree at eight years. You can also see the, uh, which one, uh, or the percentage of students that are remain enrolled at the reporting institution, and those that are known to be transferred. And also the ones that, at eight years, we do not know what happens. And again, this is available by institution, so you can see the progress. And, and keep in mind that this is at eight year point in time, regardless of what degree the student completed. Uh, and it's the same metric and measure that the college scorecard uses, um, which President Hilgerson likes. So it's the same definition, same group. Um, and also you can compare that data by those that entered either first time or transfer in. And sorry, the resolution doesn't allow for better view, but if you're looking at it on a um, tablet or, or desktop computer, it should look a lot better. But in here you should see uh, pr the comparison of those that come in as first time or transparent. And lastly, um, similar uh, data representation, but in this case, rather than looking at those students that complete at four, six, or eight years, we represent the data as those uh, by degree type. And in this case is for those that earn a certificate, uh, earn an associate's, or earn a bachelor's. Um, and then the other elements, same remain, is still enrolled, transferred, or we don't know what happened to those students. Um, this is not very interesting when you look at the four-year institutions because for the most part, they will graduate bachelors, so you don't have the, uh, that data broken down by, by level. However, when you start separating the data by entering cohort, uh, you can start seeing you know, those that come in first time versus the ones that transfer in you can start seeing the differences. But again, I would suggest you spend time on this dashboard at your own pace because there is a lot of data um, that I don't have time to cover during the, the presentation. And with that concludes the presentation and demonstration of the dashboards. You're absolutely correct, Jose, that there's a ton of data there. And with that, do I, are there any questions from anyone on the committee? 
Okay, seeing none. No? Okay. Um, do you guys keep track? I have a couple questions. Do you guys keep track of the clicks? What are people interested in looking at? I mean, do you have it? I mean, are people looking at the data dashboards? Is it Jose being Martinez, used? <laughs> Jose Martinez, for the record, I added a tracking and a counter for this since the new dashboards were implemented. So, yes, as soon as I get back to the office, I'm going to look to see how many of you looked at these dashboards. So. Why don't you start from after today, now that we've had a presentation? <laughs> um, I, I, I would say this comment to the, um, our, the chair of the board and to our interim chancellor that this is kind of information that would be really helpful to onboard new regents. I um, mean, truly, I mean, you really need to sit down and take the time. And, you know, to do it on your own, yeah, maybe you'll do it. But... It would be nice to have almost like a tutorial to help yeah. us. And I was also thinking there is so much data here, just like we asked today with so much reading, to have like an executive summary. I'm going to ask, talk with you, uh, um, Dr. Archer, and to see that maybe quarterly at the ARSA meetings, we could have like an executive summary. What are, we, what are the trends? Because, I mean, honestly, we don't have a lot of time to be all, always going into these dashboards, but... You know, you're there because I heard you mention some things today. You know, maybe you you guys could just give us a, like quarterly. What are the trends? What do we need to be looking for? I mean, sure. possibly. So maybe that's something we can look at. Maybe that's got to be out of new business. But um, and I think it's really important that we have this because this is open and transparent. We are public institutions, and this is what the taxpayers are paying for so um, yeah. they can come look. So I think it's, it's really great. And hopefully down the road we'll have more, I don't know if we'll have more resources, but what it's going to take to refine the community colleges. And thank you for listening because one size really does not fit all. So with that, you're going to stay right up there. And this was an, um, not an, um, uh, it was an information only item. So there's no, uh, vote that we need on this. So we'll go to the um, item number nine, which is the 2022-2023 financial aid report. And back to you, Jose. Thank you. Jose Martinez, for the record, I believe that's the other Jose. <laughs> no, sorry, I can sorry. take it. I'm, I, I think I'm all warmed up now, so I can. <laughs> okay. Thank you. The other Jose in system administration for the record, or no, Jose Quiroga for the record. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Locarlo and, and members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to talk about financial aid uh, today. Um, I know I'm standing between everyone's lunch, <laughs> so I will try to go as quickly as possible with the chair's permission. But of course, any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer. There are lots of reasons why uh, we do this report annually to uh, this committee. Uh, to me, the, the first one listed is the most important, uh, which is the value and the belief that no student should be denied a college education due to financial barriers. And that underpins a lot of the other reasons. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll keep moving forward in the uh, sake of time. As we look at 2022-23 financial aid, uh, across our institutions, $683.2 million were dispersed. Uh, that is a lot of money, but it went to over 31,000 students. And that is not just money in their pockets, ability to pay for aid. It is, it is a student, in many ways, students' abilities to pursue higher education. And that's why this excites me that that's why I've worked in financial aid for, uh, or, or with financial aid professionals for so long. What we see uh, over the years is an increase in the amount of financial aid dispersed. Uh, a long-term increase. There was one uh, small dip uh, in 2020-21 during COVID pandemic time, uh, but that has continued to increase uh, overall. And that's been the trend with 7% increase over the last five years. In the next several slides, we'll be slicing and dicing that in different ways uh, and, and to get some takeaways uh, of financially dispersed to students. The first way we'll slice uh, that, that 
plus million dollars is by institution. Uh, here are seven uh, institutions that grant uh, financial aid over, uh, and I'll, I'll put your attention to the uh, last two uh, columns, the one-year change and the five-year change. On the one-year change, we're seeing that most institutions uh, have increased, and that's coming out of uh, COVID enrollment uh, timeframe. On the five-year change, it's, it's a very uh, different picture in that we're seeing an increase at the four-year institutions and an overall decrease at all of the uh, two-year institutions. That follows a national trend of lower enrollment at two-year institutions uh, that we've seen over many years, more than the five years that we're looking here. And, and that tends to track with the financially dispersed. So it's not necessarily as students are getting any less financial aid per student. It, it is just overall lower enrollment. When taken together, however, at ENSHI, there is still that 7% increase in overall financial aid. Then as we, as we look at more student character, characteristics, um, in, in the interest of time, again, I will go to the last two uh, rows here. Um, and, and those are the per proportion of aid recipients who come from uh, historically minoritized uh, racial or ethnic category. Uh, out of the ones listed here, it's everyone except uh, the white category. And something that is encouraging to see here is that at most institutions or at all institutions, it's at least similar to the overall institution uh, percentage of, the, of that group of students, if not higher. That tells us uh, a lot about equity and access to financial aid uh, uh, and that's why we look at this data to make sure that students are having access to financial aid at similar rates. I'll move forward to uh, financial aid recipients by Disability Resource Center uh, status. This was uh, requested by uh, Regent Arascada and uh, definitely something that we wanted to look at. Uh, it took us some time to get it there because we had to make sure to comply with privacy laws, all of that. Um, but for the last two years, we've been able to include it. And again, we're seeing that uh, the proportion of uh, financial aid recipients uh, who have a registration with Disability Resource Center uh, is actually at all institutions higher than the overall proportion of students who uh, enroll in Disability Resource Center. I have my, I haven't looked into why, but, but one of the reasons for that could be that our Disability Resource Centers do a great job of connecting with our students, telling them the resources that are available, and working with our financial aid offices to make sure that students apply um, uh, for aid. Okay. So here we'll move forward to the average annual Pell Grant disbursements. Again, we're seeing an overall trend going up as the uh, maximum Pell Grant amount has increased over the years. Uh, and something important to note here is that a lot of the times when we discuss Pell Grant, we do so uh, with the number of the maximum Pell Grant uh, amount. In 2022-23, that was $6,895. However, that's not what the average student receives. Uh, a little over 31,000 students receive Pell Grant at NC institutions in Nevada. That's a lot of students. Their average was 4,149. Now, the reason that occurs, there's several reasons why a student doesn't receive the maximum uh, in the fall spring semester. Uh, if a, student's, uh, a student would have to qualify for the highest financial need, so it's not necessarily something that they can do different. But one of the areas that do increase the average Pell Grant is enrollment. Uh, if, they're, uh, if they're enrolling full-time, they will receive more uh, Pell Grant uh, than if they're enrolling at half-time or less. So this is another important number to, to just be aware of, take a look at. We're slightly under the, the national uh, uh, median. Again, not necessarily something that we can always act on, but an important number to keep track of. Now, I love this number because this shows that year to year, over the last five years, we've continued to decrease our loans. 
Um, that means that even though our overall aid has continued to increase, our overall number of loans has continued to decrease. Now, whenever I say that, I never want to say that there's no place for uh, loans. Loans, uh, unfortunately, uh, are often necessary. I, I had to take out loans for my uh, undergraduate education. <laughs> However, we do want to see uh, that number being kept in check, that it is not ballooning, and that uh, our students are able to take advantage of other types of aid outside of loans. I, I will also mention that that loan decrease is also part of a national trend. Uh, students are more aware of the pitfalls of loans and our financial aid institution, or our financial aid offices, our institutions uh, have put more and more resources into uh, increasing the amount of counseling, increasing the amount of financial literacy resources for our students, uh, and we do see an impact in those numbers. Another important uh, way to look at financial aid is the state-supported programs. As we look here at our six uh, major programs uh, that are state-funded, they add up to $148.2 million for 2022-23. However, it's important to note that the largest program, the Regents Higher Education Opportunity Award, is most of that $81.7 million is actually funded by a registration fee set aside, approved by the board uh, and paid by students. That is 60, uh, approximately $64.3 million of those 148 million is actually student fees reapportioned uh, back to grants, scholarships, and work study. So if, if we were to reduce that to the $17.4 million that is state funded, that then the largest program would be the Millennium Scholarship. I'll go ahead and move on to the categories of financial aid. Just a, a quick definitions here uh, because we're talking about similar uh, words. Uh, financial aid tends to use a lot of uh, terminology like categories, type, source that uh, are very, uh, although you may be familiar with it, wanted to make sure to include it in here. Um, the difference between grants and scholarships, they're both free money. Grants are usually need-based. Student shows financial need usually through the FAFSA or other alternative form. Scholarships tend to be merit-based. However, there's a lot of mixing between the two. Some scholarships require needs, some grants require uh, uh, some kind of test score, something like that. Loans are, are what they, uh, what are just as, as they sound, they have to be repaid, and work-study requires the student to work while earning a wage that is considered financial aid as well. So as we look at financial aid by category, Loans remain the highest uh, category of aid. However, over the years it has decreased. Uh, looking five years back, it's decre uh, decreased from 43% to 37.7. And looking even farther back, that was a higher proportion. So again, we're seeing that decrease in loans, increase in the other, ca other categories. Overall, a really, uh, a really uh, good thing to see in here. As we look at sources of aid, the major sources are federal, state, institutional, and private. Uh, I, I've listed here all the uh, or some of the types of aid uh, in each uh, source, uh, but we'll not go uh, through them in the interest of time. As we look at this uh, breakout, uh, the largest by far uh, source is the federal government. Uh, that has decreased. Uh, it was 71% back in 2014-15. Uh, we have increased as other types of aid have uh, become available. Our institutions, uh, of course, are working to increase institutional aid to students. The creation of Silver State Opportunity Grant, increase in Millennium uh, Scholarship Awards, uh, all of these things have decreased the overall percentage of federal aid as other sources of aid have increased. And one, however, I will mention that um, we, although we have a, a, a similar, slightly higher percentage of uh, federal uh, aid compared to other states, uh, we're more in the 55 or 56% uh, nationally, 
when we look at grants specifically, uh, we have a much lower percentage of, uh, of state funded grants compared to uh, national. Uh, and that's because our major state aid, again, is a scholarship, not a grant. And so, that, so as we look at sources of aid, that's an important part uh, to, to keep in mind, our largest state-based uh, grant uh, being the Silver State Opportunity Grant. Then we'll look over at types of financial aid, two types here. Oh. Chair Del Carlo. Uh, yes, I didn't see you. Go ahead, uh, Regent Cruz Thank Cruise you, Crawford. Chair. Regent Cruz Crawford. Jose, it's nice seeing you again. We got to spend two days together, and he really told me a lot about um, his work, so I appreciate that. You said that most state has grants, not scholarships. Is there a huge difference in graduation rates when they're merit-based compared to the need-based, or do you have that information? That is a very good question. I do not have that data statewide mm -hmm. right now. That's something that I could definitely take a look at. Um, I, I know that in the uh, dashboard that uh, my colleague and friend, Jose Martinez, is mm -hmm. uh, worked on, there is uh, some data on Pell Grant uh, graduation rates, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's one that we already have available. Uh, I don't have that split, but I, I will look into uh, seeing if we have that data. I just think if we want to move toward getting some more grants, then that might be helpful. Thank you. Uh, and one thing, Jose Quiroga, for the record. One other thing that I will add is that there has been, uh, there was a recent study uh, from uh, an interim study on the state-based financial aid at the legislature, uh, and the consultant they hired did come with some conclusions, uh, trying not, I don't have, uh, all the conclusions at the top of my head right now, but one of them is that the Silver State Opportunity Grant, which is the major uh, grant, uh, state-funded grant program, um, seemed to have by far the most effect on student success. Uh, and so that, that is perhaps an opportunity looking forward. And then looking back, uh, again at types of financial aid, need versus non-need, you will notice this I listed all the, the same financial aid on both uh, columns, and they were just listed in, in the kind of priority. Most grants are need-based, most scholarships are non-need-based, and ho however, uh, they still cross over. And here I listed uh, the, the last, I believe, 10 years of uh, need versus non-need based. And what we saw were set, uh, many years from 2011-12 until 2020-21, uh, uh, the, the percentage of need-based aid kept shrinking. And that's due to many factors, including uh, fewer subsidized loans being taken out because subsidized loans are need-based. So that was something positive we saw. Also, uh, because uh, the Millennium Scholarship increased, again, a positive thing, more uh, whereas uh, Silver State Opportunity Grant, other grants didn't have a mechanism for increasing uh, past the amount that, that was uh, set aside by the legislature. However, that's sta uh, stabilized, actually gone a little bit back up in the last couple of years. I, I will be skipping through most of cost of attendance. I just wanted to, uh, uh, put out, uh, out there that the direct registration fees are not the only cost students bear. As we all know, there are a lot of um, indirect costs of room and board, transportation, personal expenses a student uh, has to pay for in order to remain uh, taking their classes. Um, this cost of attendance that student or that institutions uh, create uh, uh, includes all of these costs and it serves as a, as a financial uh, or a limit to the amount of aid a student can receive. And it, and it is also used in calculating student need. I, I will breeze uh, brief through them here, but uh, I included off campus uh, and with parent and on campus uh, undergraduate uh, cost of attendances. I did want to mention the FAFSA, Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Uh, because it is such an important part for most students in applying for uh, financial aid. 
the FAFSA is a tool to determine financial need. Uh, the applications at studentaid.gov, and I mention the, the website because uh, I always, whenever I get a chance, want to tell students, go to the actual website and never pay uh, to, to fill out the application. It is the freeze in the name, uh, and I want that to be out there and be known uh, so that students are not scammed while trying to, to fill out financial aid applications. This application is required for all federal student aid, it is used also by our institutions to award most other need-based aid because it is a, a very good tool to determine financial need. And the application is usually available October 1st. I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about the delay that happened this year for the upcoming FAFSA. And the FAFSA uh, uses a, a federal methodology to estimate the expected family contribution and we, then we use the cost of attendance minus the expected family contribution, and that equals student need. And, and then looking at cost of attendance minus expected family contribution minus total aid received, and that's the remaining student need. So if we look at all students' average expenses minus their financial aid minus what uh, we have calculated or the federal government has calculated a student's uh, and their family can pay toward education, that's remaining student need, and that's what we're all working to uh, fill with financial aid. I wanted to include a couple of examples of, of what a financial aid offer may look like. Actual financial aid offers are much longer than this. They don't, they don't have all, uh, all of these abbreviations, uh, and they have a lot of information for students. But the reason why I included it, and these are all sample numbers, I want to tell that to my institutions, I don't, I don't mean to imply, uh, any institution uh, being able to uh, give an award versus another. It was just a, a way to show how all of these concepts would work together. Uh, cost of attendance at UNLV uh, during the 23-24 year, 15 credits would be the $29,031. And saying that this student had an expected family contribution of 18,000, their remaining need and how financial aid would work together to fulfill that need leaving the, a student with $1,131, and then what their options would be student loan-wise to fill that in. I will not spend a lot of time on this one unless there are questions, but uh, it's, it's an important way to, to look at uh, decisions a student may have to make on taking a loan, on not taking a loan, uh, and all of those concepts. My last slide here will be on the better FAFSA or FAFSA simplification. It does not affect 2022-23, which is what we've been talking about, but it is uh, something that is in the minds of a lot of our students because they're currently filling out the FAFSA for this upcoming year. Uh, dubbed better FAFSA, FAFSA simplification. Um, it is uh, a, a change in the FAFSA that occurred this year. Um, it changed the timeline, usually opening October 1st. It was delayed until late December for a soft opening and er actually early January for the full launch of the FAFSA. We still have some students that are having trouble completing the FAFSA, specifically students whose parents do not have a social security number or, or are not documented. Um, there are technical glitches that are not allowing those students to fully complete the FAFSA. Again, because this is a place that I can, that, that some students will hear me, I want to strongly urge all students to attempt to complete as much of the FAFSA as possible, even if they're not able to complete it, because our financial aid offices I know are out there working with students and, may, and trying to alleviate some of the problems uh, that have come up. Usually by this point, institutions would have FAFSA data. Uh, they don't yet. We expect the Department of Education will release that data to our institutions by mid-March or so. Uh, and at that point, financial aid offices will be able to work on uh, awarding uh, federal aid. Some of the major changes to the FAFSA, no, with all those problems, there are still some good things that happened. And uh, they include uh, fewer questions for most students uh, for the FAFSA, a direct connection to the IRS. So that's, I know that I struggled getting my W-2 and my 1040 and, and which field, field seven versus field 13 when filling out the FAFSA, and I know many of you have as well. Uh, and this is meant to make it a lot simpler so that if a student has already been fully uh, verified uh, their identity through the FAFSA, they can fully connect with the IRS and it makes it a lot easier to fill out the FAFSA. 
you, you'll stop hearing me in a couple of years referring to EFC, uh, now it's the student aid index. That's a better word for it because it has never been meant to be how much a student actually pays. It's meant to be an index number that's used for financial aid purposes. Th there is a change to the, to the current analysis. More students are expected to receive more Pell Grant. So that average Pell Grant number, I'm hoping that it, that it will be uh, affected by this because we expect a lot more students getting the maximum Pell Grant and uh, more Pell Grant overall. And finally, uh, uh, families with more than one student in college may see reduced grant eligibility. That is one of the downsides. Previously, the calculation used to uh, divide some of the income on the number of students in college. This calculation no longer does that. So some families may see a change there. And if any family is, is currently being affected by this, I would highly recommend that they uh, talk to, to their financial aid office uh, because there, there are sometimes uh, the ability there to, to review the aid and see, see that all the information uh, and all the aid available uh, has been taken advantage of. The last thing that I will say before questions is that uh, members of the committee may recall that uh, this presentation is usually given in September. So we're six months earlier, and that's all thanks to, to the work out of our financial aid offices. They, they work really hard to get that data to us so that it can be analyzed and aggregated uh, six months earlier than usual, and that's what we'll be working to do in the future. So with that, thank you, Chair. I'll take any questions. Thank you so much. Lots of information there. With that, do we have any questions from the committee? I think that lunch is getting in the way. <laughs> okay. Um, if not, oh, you do have a question? No? Uh, uh, President Dalpy, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Chair DiCarlo. I just wanted to take the pressure off Mr. Caroga for being the one standing between lunch and us. Um, I do have a couple comments real quick. I appreciate the, the report. Um, what it amounts to is a way to look at how we bring down federal dollars, which as a state we have lagged behind on the grant front, the financial aid front for the last 20 plus years that I've been here. Um, and so I appreciate looking at these numbers. And when I look at our strategy at a very small school, just to put a kudos out to our financial aid department, JW and crew down there, um, on slide 11, I, it said that the average, I think, was 37% um, was grants. We are at 63% um, grants, 21% um, scholarships, which puts us in 84% of money going to students that they do not need to repay, which at a community college is a very different model, or a very different student and a very different model to help students enter the workforce, which usually takes them a longer time to get there. But hopefully debt free. And so um, I, um, I appreciate the overall look at the data because it tells me internally our strategies are doing something right at our school, which again, we're very different than others. So I appreciate it. Thank you. That's an excellent point. And I know that CSN in their December report for their foundation, their one of their goals is to have no student debt, which is very admirable. So that's probably something we can add to um, item number 10, new business. So if there's no other questions, I thank you so much for all the great information. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, we'll go on to number, item number 10. Is there any new business? Yes, uh, Regent Cruz Crawford. Regent Cruz Crawford, for the record. Um, in regard to the data dashboard, I'd like to request board to have um, the retention rates put into the employee headcount. Um, I'd also like to add state demographics in all as an option to select for all of our race and ethnicity because I believe that our goal is to match our state demographics. I'd also like to, as a third item, look at trends for bridging the data source gaps met by iPads and also look at either new or different data sources that we can use. And then this is not the data dashboard. Um, this is a, just another item. Previously, we talked about aligning the course codes between institutions, and I just kind of want an update on where we are um, with that. Thank you. Is there any other new? Oh, Regent Brown, go ahead. Thank you, Regent Brown, for the record. Um, this already lives on our... Um, new business log, but I want to bring it up for the record because we talked about it. Um, I'd like to either 
through an ad hoc committee or an agendized work session, establish new metrics to track community college success and accountability. Both uh, Regent Del Carlo and I brought this up last June. So I am glad to see some movement, but I do want to make sure taking into account our four community college uh, presidents um, feedback today that we take it a step further and pick back up on the new uh, business log from last year. Thank you very much, Regent Brown. Any other new business? And I do want to say that today the House is supposed to be voting on the workforce bill. I think we all got legislative alerts. Have you heard anything, President Zaragoza? No, I haven't either. And that used to be called short-term pal, but now the new um, um, way to call it is workforce pal. With that, we're going to go to public comment. I will ask for public comment from the following sites first. Is there any public comment at Great Basin College? There is no public comment at GBC at this time. Okay. Is there any public comment at the system office in Reno? None in Reno. Okay. Is there any public comment here in Las Vegas? I'm seeing none. Is there any public comment on the phone? There's none at this time. Okay. And with that, we are only one minute over. This meeting is adjourned, and it is time for lunch. <laughs>